Okay, we'll get going now. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to Wet Talk 4. Uh, thanks for braving the nice weather uh, that's in the, at least in this part of the country. Um, and uh, uh, joining us uh, today um, for, a, oops, sorry, for a, uh, yeah, I mentioned our first Wet Talk of the year um, with the wonderful and the wonderful water worlds of Anusha Jami. Uh, I'm Dennis Murphy, uh, director at SSV of uh, Water and Sustainable Life. Uh, you might have seen our announcement um, on sustainable life, uh, but first about uh, Sustainable Silicon Valley, uh, 20 years old, 20 years old plus right now. Um, we're a nonprofit think and do tank. Uh, we're known mainly for uh, water use, reuse, and air quality, and uh, just and mobility projects. Um, but uh, we also want to take a uh, larger view, and that's the deal with uh, the sustainable life um, rollout. Uh, that um, we're actually going to be facing quite a different world post pandemic, and. Uh, we want to certainly make it a better one and uh, a decarbonized one, and uh, uh, you know, with our infrastructure actually matches our aspirations, which would be quite a feat. Um, so I mentioned the sustainable life uh, rollout. It's uh, the newsletter went out, and uh, we that will be a major part of our website, and we will. Um, be having events and different talks. Uh, I think they'll be called Earth Talks um, uh, on a broad range of different uh, issues and probably a bit more, um, certainly a bit more consumer focused. Uh, some housekeeping items. Uh, we did send out, although the messaging, it's very tough to see that we, we did have a Google form uh, for advanced questions. Um, for people that like to plan. And, uh, but we will be monitoring the chat and the Q&A. Um, probably not much polling going on during this uh, um, event as well. So uh, there will be uh, certainly question rounds. So um, keep that going. Q&A preferred, but, but you can use chat too. Um, so I'd uh, like to introduce uh, Dr. Nusha Jami, as you can see, she has uh, a fair amount of plate spinning with Stanford Water in the West. I, I uh, took the liberty of, of checking out the Stanford hex color. So we have an exact color match on, the, on that red um, and with Stanford Woods. And uh, she recently kind of rolled off um, after two terms at the Bay Area Water Board and uh, not taking a break, went right into the SFPUC. Um, just a few other things about uh, Nusha's focus has been in sustainable water resource management and smart cities, uh, the, the famous water energy food nexus. And um, there's a lot of things from her bio that, uh, that, I mean, actually makes quite a lot of sense uh, when you get to know Nusha that she uses data science principles to study human and policy dimensions and the, the impacts uh, of urban water and, and hydrologic systems. And uh, research has been interdisciplinary and impact focused. So a famous interdisciplinarian. Um, Nusha is also a member of the National Academy uh, Board on Water Science and Technology. Um, she did have a stint with the Pacific Institute as a senior researcher and also um, uh, was a science and technology fellow on the um, California Senate Natural Resources and Water Committee. And so has an idea of uh, that particular kind of sausage making as well, which uh, I think is a really valuable uh, um, experience um, and uh, not for the faint of heart. And uh, also obviously published a lot of different things that we'll be talking about and uh, co-authored two books. Um, 
sees opinion pieces across uh, spectrum, the New York Times, the Mercury News, SAC B. Um, her academic background, uh, a PhD in civil and environmental engineering from UC Irvine, um, MS in hydrology and water resources from the University of Arizona. So she has a, a nice dry background and as well as a BS in civil engineering from Amir Kabir, I'm not sure if I get that right, but University in Tehran. So um, yes, actually a uh, very deserty background. So uh, with, oh, one thing as a reminder, uh, at one of the kind of a, a tradition will be the um, Felicia Marcus magic wand question. If you had your magic wand and you know could will things to happen, so we'll we'll have to keep that in mind for later. So uh, with that, I'll uh, let Nusha take her screen and start uh, the presentation. Thank you, Dennis. That was a very for your very kind introduction. Um, I just actually want to take this chance and clarify that actually uh, Iran has a very diverse um, uh, climate patterns and uh, the part I lived in the city I grew up in Tehran is actually it's sort of similar to Denver so we have four seasons and uh, it's uh, it's uh, about 2,000 feet above um, sea level and um, the ski resort is actually about one hour from my home so um, so it's a, it, and then you, if, as you go south, you have drier, more desert-like uh, temperatures. And there are two main uh, mountain ranges in Iran, uh, Alborz and Zagros, which are um, uh, sort of uh, among um, highest mountain ranges in the world. So just fun facts, fun facts for everybody who doesn't know much about Iran. Um, so I'm going to, um, talk to you about the piece we wrote actually early, late last year on the hidden role of water infrastructure in driving COVID-19 recovery. Um, since it had a, a broad brush and talked about water as an as a, um, issue that we are facing in the century and what we, need, we can do actually to take advantage of this crisis we are facing to sort of um, um, and leverage the opportunities that are out there to sort of get out of the uh, challenges we are facing today. I did this with a, a friend of mine at, and a colleague at uh, Brookings Institute, which I later will touch base on. Um, we live, as most of you know, in a world defined by our 19th century laws, 20th century infrastructure, and the 21st century challenges. And the mismatch between these three are quite uh, obvious in this day and age. Um, we also are facing um, a lot of water uh, issues around equity and affordability in our country. Um, more than 2 million Americans live without basic access to safe drinking water and sanitation. And just think about it right now in the situation we are in with COVID-19 and the, importance, the important role that water is playing in, um, you know, and the, uh, uh, in, uh, making sure everybody has access to hygiene and they can take care of, uh, you know, wash hands and um, wash uh, everything that they have to make sure they don't, um, that they can prevent um, uh, uh, and avoid getting uh, COVID-19. And, um, and the fact that these people don't have access to water is quite disappointing and sad and uh, actually um, an opportunity to kind of revisit what are our priorities. Um, also, uh, a few other stats to think about. Um, about 44 million Americans uh, are served by uh, water systems that are recently um, either had health-based safe drinking water uh, violations or had issues with reporting violations. 17% um, of Americans li uh, live in rural areas and that uh, have uh, issues with safe drinking water. About 23% of uh, private wells um, that people depend on um, have been tested for various contaminants um, um, that, uh, such as arsenic, uranium, nitrate, E. coli. 12% uh, of uh, uh, people living in rural areas report issues with their sewage systems. 
and a Native American household are 19 times more likely than white households to lack indoor plumbing. Again, um, think about this in the situation we are in right now with COVID-19 and, and we have been in for the past year. The piece that we wrote uh, focused on five um, areas challenge, um, challenge, five challenges we are facing in five areas that sort of provide opportunities for us to revisit the way we manage and um, deal at, with our water uh, challenges. Um, what the first area we focused on was boosting water equity and affordability. And I'm going to touch on the issues that are actually causing this as well as um, some of the stats actually I already talked about, but um, sort of overall perspective on the issues around equity and affordability. Um, for most of you who are attending this, um, this you know the staggering um, social and economic cost of aging and inappropriate infrastructure. Um, a lot of the infrastructure we built in the 20th century um, are reaching the end of their lifetime. And uh, we are dealing with a lot of um, um, you know, aging infrastructure that needs to be replaced or, um, or actually maintained um, um, with a higher cost. And also um, it's, uh, a lot of that infrastructure, for example, some of the dams and um, other large infrastructure that we have um, are sort of managed with certain um, uh, perspective and assumptions that they don't hold anymore. And um, for this crowd, climate issues managing our large infrastructure while dealing with uncertainties that climate change is causing from climate patterns that are changing to extreme events that we are facing to um, some of the droughts and wildfires we have been experiencing recently. So that inappropriate infrastructure um, um, piece is actually uh, partly the type of infrastructure, partly the way we manage that infrastructure that's actually causing issues. Um, another I touched on this, but the reality is climate change is actually here. It's not something in, in the future that we have to deal with. It is actually here and is actually has altered our natural and water systems. And again, I touched on this a little uh, in the previous slide, but um, we are dealing with a lot of extreme events that we have to deal with. And we are not very well equipped in the, within the boundaries that I set with our uh, 19th century laws and 20th century infrastructure to deal with this challenge that you're facing today, which is altering so many different assumptions that we have relied on for many years. When you talk about affordability, another piece of affordability is the way we have set up our um, utilities and how and who they can provide service to. Um, this, I, I really like this map because it sort of provide a very broad perspective on um, how uh, affordability is measured across the US. And this is basically showing at risk and high risk census tracts uh, across urban areas. In, um, and you can see actually across the US and you can see um, there's so many concerns, especially with major urban areas when it comes to people having issues with access to water or actually are closed to the verge of not having affordable water. And, um, and you can see California, as if you follow my um, um, cursor here, you can see California is um, uh, in no way uh, out of um, this problem is actually, we can see a lot of black areas which are actually already high risk track, uh, census tract areas that uh, shows people not having affordable water and a lot of gray that shows that there are people who are in the verge of uh, hitting that line. And this is actually sh using the APA's um, affordability um, uh, measure of two and a half percent of your um, uh, income going to uh, paying for your water rates, um, water bill, sorry. Um, also, water utilities are facing evolving demand patterns, which actually, again, another side of affordability and issues with rates is that um, as water demands and population growth has decoupled in recent years, we see that um, many, uh, in many ways, the way we thought demand is gonna grow, so we have to actually build more infrastructure and meet future to, in order to meet future demand is not really holding that much. This is actually an example from city of Seattle. Um, and um, what you see is, um, these um, dotted lines are showing the 
uh, how the demand were expected to change over time. And you can see every one of these demand forecasts have been um, inaccurate. And gradually, the city has re realized that actually the demand is not really necessarily growing as population and uh, is growing and economic growth is being observed, but actually is on a um, sort of a downward trend. Um, and this is not just Seattle's issue. We see that across the US, especially um, you know, in the cities actually that are like, for example, Phoenix is very, um, uh, very much a, a, a growing city that sort of a lot of people are moving there. Uh, population has been increasing significantly, but you see that demand has been quite steady, similar to San Diego. I just picked a few cities. Um, um, but this, this is not an uncommon thing. And we actually, in my team, we did a study for the Bay Area and looked at the water demand um, since the uh, 80s. And what you see here, very similar thing. You have uh, three different cities with th three different water use um, uh, patterns. And what you see is, regardless of the type of water use patterns, we see that water demand has been quite steady and actually dropping, uh, especially during various droughts. But every time that's dropping, it's not necessarily going back, but actually sort of, um, or actually increasing, but actually sort of, again, um, either on a downward trend or steady over time. So when you talk about affordability and equity, I always want to think about two things. One is how do we set our rates and how do we sort of think about affordability and equity within that rate setting process? But also um, we constantly, I mean, we, we in California deal with Prop 218, which is always an issue when we are trying to provide um, state um, or actually local financial assistance to people to pay for their bills. But the reality is um, these things exist for energy and telecom sectors. So uh, something similar to that for, the, um, for California can be very useful in order to make sure everybody has access to water and not going to experience shutoffs. And many of you, if, when, uh, if you're working for water utilities, you know the uh, moratoriums that were passed, um, uh, that were signed by the governor um, and different cities actually have been um, sort of a commitment to making sure that everybody has access to bot water and their waters are not shut off. It's actually a very, what has been a very costly um, 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 ex exercise for, um, for many utilities. And that actually partly is driven by the fact that we uh, have not done a very good job before, exp before hitting this um, um, uh, stressor we are facing right now uh, called COVID-19 uh, to deal with the issues around affordability and access. And now all of a sudden we have all these people who need to have access to water and they can't pay their bills and their uh, water and their water bills are growing. And the, you know, the utilities are also experiencing the uh, challenge of not being able to recover their rates. Um, uh, and so, and then another piece of this is actually, again, the piece of asset management and making sure our um, utilities are able to to maintain and operate their systems, uh, at their aging systems in the most affordable way, which again, translate into the way they set the rates because the more they have to invest in dealing with their fixed infrastructure and fixed costs, the easier it is for them to recover some of that cost because um, and the faster you can, the more you can do to prevent some of these um, um, uh, uh, system breakdowns and uh, pipe breaks and um, you know infrastructure breakdowns, uh, the the cheaper it is to um, uh, maintain them and um, to deal with them uh, more proactively. And then potentially that translate into not needing to recover all the costs that are associated with that through the rates. And then another piece, again, is revisiting the way we define water affordability. I showed you that figure with affordability, which um, the, uses that two and a half percent measure that has been put in place by EPA, but there have been a lot of studies showing that that is not really the best, best way of measuring affordability. And there are so many newer ways of, uh, and newer ways of doing that, especially if you really wanna make sure the lower percentile that uh, 
that are experiencing um, um, economic uh, hardship can definitely have access to water. So we need to do a better job of um, figuring out how to measure affordability and who we are want to make sure we can provide services to. And another piece, again, as I touched on, is demand forecasting, because if we are um, actually perceiving that demand is going to grow in the future and we are going to invest in infrastructure that is for that kind of demand growth, then we actually need to think about, okay, uh, what are we investing in and who is going to pay for that investment? And are we investing in infrastructure in that we might not necessarily need? And maybe there's a different way of investing in infrastructure and um, different way of approaching uh, uh, reliability and resiliency in the long run, rather than sort of uh, uh, making an assumption that the demand growth requires uh, more investment in um, bigger, larger, more centralized systems. Another piece of this is amplifying water in climate discussions. Uh, many of you know that there obviously a lot of focus on, um, I'm going to put the slide here, but the point is we are experiencing climate change. We are experiencing the impacts of climate change. And I'm sure you all have heard that if, um, you know, climate change is shark, water is its um, um, teeth and, uh, you know, and so many other metaphors that everybody is using to sort of highlight the fact that the impacts of climate change is being experienced through water, too much water, too little water, um, and um, the, the change in the timing of the way we get water and, um, and all that is definitely challenging us in so many different ways. But the problem is right now, the way we are approaching climate change and um, sort of the, uh, or addressing the issues related to climate change is very much actually focused on um, mitigation rather than adaptation. Just to give some sense of what do I mean by increasing impact of climate change and the costs associated with it. This is the slide prepared by NOAA um, and it shows the um, different disasters um, that has been dealt with since the 1980s and sort of um, uh, accumulation of these disasters over, uh, over each year, over certain months. And what you can see is um, uh, the, in the past decade, many of the years we have lived in uh, from 2011, um, uh, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, we can see that the number of natural disasters we have experienced due to climate change has been increasing significantly compared to what you see in the gray area, which is um, what was happening before in the decades before, and actually the average over time um, that is this black line here. So we are seeing more and more natural disasters and the cumulative effect of that is definitely very obvious here. And what you see here is actually putting dollar signs on top of what we are experiencing, which is again, what you see here is um, that uh, what we have experienced in the past 20 years is definitely way above the average experience we have had before. And we are seeing more years with extreme events and more dollars that needs to be spent reactively to deal with the consequences of these natural disasters we are dealing with from wildfires to hurricanes to floods to um, um, to droughts all these sort of um, these are the cumulative dollars that have spent each year for um, different events um, that you're experiencing and I you know now going back to dealing with climate change what we are seeing is there is a lot of action and focus on proactive, um, um, actions around energy. How are we can how can we sort of deal with um, reduce our energy use? How can we um, um, uh, mitigate our um, uh, sort of um, how can we reduce the carbon emissions? How can we um, invest in different technologies that can help us do what we want, how we want it, where we want it, um, but actually have less environmental impacts when it comes to uh, um, when it comes to emissions. However, when you're talking about those dollars that are being spent, water is always left behind or left um, outside of it. And we, what we are doing is we are reacting to climate change through adapt adaptive investment um, uh, to deal with uh, natural disasters that are coming through water. But again, the adaptation part is also very much as if it is reactive and it's very much water focused, um, but it's also very much focused on, um, um, again, so what kind of technology do we need? 
to deal with, um, to adapt to climate change. And um, the argument here is technologies are great. They can do a lot of things. They're not going to help us to get out of every situation we are dealing with because the, the laws and regulations and policies and governance and management systems that we have are actually there and they are part of the process of uh, embracing some of these technologies, making sure some of them are not incorporated in the process and are actually sort of as holding the door for what comes in, what goes out. So there, is, there needs to be sort of a re-evaluation of what role those um, governance and structures are playing in dealing with climate change and water actually has to be part of both mitigation and adaptation as we are dealing with climate change and some of those dollars that are being invested in mitigation right now needs to be sort of maybe um, uh, repurposed for water uh, solutions as a way of actually not only mitigating but also adapting. However, those um, systems that I mentioned with management and governance and, um, and laws that we are dealing with, um, they're actually providing, um, while in many ways they have helped us to and, uh, like think about the way we have set up our water systems in the past 50 100 or 100 years and think about Clean Water Act, which was actually it's um, uh, reaching its 50th anniversary um, uh, of being passed. Um, they have really helped us to grow and um, reach a, a different um, uh, economic and um, uh, uh, level and it has helped us to grow uh, uh, socially and economically significantly. However, those laws and regulations are very much put in silos. We actually establish these systems as we have people who provide water to us, we have people who provide wastewater, take away the wastewater that we have people who deal with um, uh, stormwater and floods and drainage. And these, these silos that we have created are actually are not necessarily crossing each other as much. They're very much uh, put together in a way of a sort of top-down system that we have. Um, water comes in, we provide it to the customers, it goes out, so it gets picked up. And also when it rains, we have to deal with the storm and the um, drainage issues we have to deal with. And these silos when I, talk, I was talking to, about climate change earlier, are sort of part of the hinders that we are facing when we are thinking about how to deal with the impacts of climate change and what do we need to do. And when we are talking about mitigation and adaptation, some of the money needs to be sort of reinvested in this sort of how can we get rid of these silos or actually make them blend into each other in a more effective way and make sure we are investing in the right set of solutions for the future and not for now. Um, and, um, and how can we sort of revisit this top-down governance structure that we have, which is, which is sort of uh, um, established based on abundance and stationarity, um, climate would stay as it is, hydrological system is not going to change, and also we are going to actually have um, water systems that um, um, sort of, uh, we, we will always have another drop of water to go and bring. So we don't need to think about uh, the limitations that we are facing, the environmental limitations that we are facing. And actually that is what we see here right now is not holding anymore in the 21st century. So as we transition from the 20th century uh, infrastructure model to the 21st century um, uh, infrastructure model, I would like to call this 21st century uh, infrastructure model a hybrid system. Uh, the infrastructure systems that we have, the centralized system we have put in, put in place, they're there to stay. Uh, you know, we we have um, we have so many communities that depend on them. Um, they are uh, they need to be operated and maintained till we can actually keep put them keep them there. They have actually established certain new. Um, uh, sort of realities and dynamics that are um, that um, that we are dependent on, and um, however we don't need to go through the same path as we sort of move forward. And the 21st century model is going to be very very different from the from what we had done before. Uh, we are constantly thinking about this um, uh, sort of like a. Um, circular economy, we talk about circular economy all the time in every field you want to imagine. Um, but in water, actually, it is also a reality. It is sort of happening. Uh, we see a lot more action around reuse, uh, 
be it uh, what we have in the city of San Francisco with um, on-site reuse to some of the centralized reuse systems that we have put in place. We see a lot of action around green infrastructure, um, about resource recovery, uh, recharge, manage aquifer recharge, and um, basically, and, and a lot of work around conservation and efficiency, trying to make sure that we are uh, not wasting any drop of water, and actually a lot of work around um, um, uh, source protection, which actually is a very important action around access and um, and um, sustainability, because the, the less we pollute, the more we have, the less we pollute, the more people have access to, the more broader group of people have access to that resource. So um, so this, this hybrid model, it will incorporate these uh, small marginal solutions within our existing centralized top-down model that we have. However, that requires those silos to be broken and be able to make sure that the wastewater people talk to water people and water people talk into stormwater people and making sure there is a sort of like a easy flow of resources, money and human resources that goes across these silos in order to work. Another piece of that is the silos that we have, not only within water sector, but from water sector with other sectors. So that needs to also be revisited. So these, the need for these governance approaches to enable this transition to this hybrid system is quite real. And again, I'm going to emphasize on the fact that we are, what we, the limitation here for us is not necessarily the technological limitation. It's much more governance limitation, the social, institutional, and financial barriers that we have that, that can address these issues. So I'm going to touch on two examples here, which I think it would be sort of valuable to um, sort of focus on and also brings uh, these limitations we are facing a little bit into life. Um, uh, one is the fragmentation we are facing and the role of green infrastructure or nature-based solutions. Um, so, uh, you know, as you're dealing with climate change, you know, there's much more realization that um, the instead of fighting with nat fighting nature, we have to work with nature. I'm an engineer, and the, uh, the 20th century engineering uh, education has always been around how can we make sure we can actually build our way out of the limitations nature puts upon us. Um, you know, um, again, from centralized infrastructures that we built to actually seawalls. Um, to many other things that we are doing in our uh, sort of engineering approach to um, dealing with resource uh, access. Um, all of that we are, have come to realize is actually not sustainable because nature uh, can be our ally actually in many ways. Um, think about sort of these nature-based solutions. They actually not only can provide water and air quality um, benefits, they can be we are learning more and more. They can be very useful for fire resilience. They can help us to deal with sea level rise and adapting to sea level rise. They can help us with groundwater recharge, uh, you know, uh, and um, creating open spaces that can help us with um, uh, with um, uh, you know some of the social and. Uh, 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 public health issues that we are dealing with. So there's a long list of benefits these systems have. However, they are facing, and, and you know, just an example is that, for, for example, in the Bay Area, we have been trying to deal with this whole uh, shoreline, uh, revisiting our shorelines and dealing with climate change and uh, sea level rise, the impacts of sea level rise, and from the water utilities and wastewater utilities that have, um, have um, infrastructure by the bay or close to the water to actually communities that depend on um, some of the existing infrastructure to prevent the um, prevent them uh, prevent some of the um, um, uh, you know flooding issues that they might be dealing with or they have been dealing with in over time um, addressing sea level rise is bec has become a very important focus of the bay area and we need to sort of deal with that and um, however we have had a lot of issues, like we have tried very hard in the Bay Area at least, try to sort of revisit how we do, um, how we do deal with these um, issues around sea level rise and Bay Shore, um, sort of dealing with that um, Bay and uh, what needs to be done and what kind of infrastructure do we need to prevent these issues around flooding and sea level rise. And what we are constantly facing with is the regulatory rigidity, which is actually put in place partly in, the, in that model that we have had 
uh, how do we define what do we def what is infrastructure and how do we define infrastructure as an engineer i would think infrastructure potentially if I, I think about my educational background i would think about anything that's built by me by by people li like me uh, that uh, includes concretes and metals and uh, you know all sort of gray systems that can put in place to deal with uh, what we want to do. However, the reality is we are more, more and more realizing the wetlands are infrastructure, the marshal, marsh, marshlands are infrastructure, the actually the parks that we have are infrastructure, the green spaces that we have is green infrastructure. So they actually are part of infrastructure system that we have, but we have not built them in the way that we had to. So how do we measure performance of these systems are key in order to make sure they are actually measured and performed, uh, sorry, they're, they're um, assessed in the right light and evaluated in the right light. And also actually we need to kind of also understand how redefining this um, the definition of infrastructure can also help us to access money because the reality is the way the federal and state dollars are invested are very much focused on the um, traditional infrastructure model that we had and the traditional set of infrastructure we have, which is much more deterministic in many ways in a short run, but not necessarily as um, flexible and resilient in the long run. So for example, if I build a wastewater treatment plant, I know uh, within that gray infrastructure I have, what comes in, what goes out, how many people can I serve, uh, how many communities I can serve, how, uh, how it's gonna function. But the reality is as um, that system is set up with certain assumptions that might not hold, for example, droughts can impact uh, the reality of my system, a sea level rise can impact the reality of my infrastructure. So that, that, is, that is the sort of uh, deterministic approach that we have had in the 20th century and we have to change. Uh, the other piece of it, as I said, is the fragmentation piece and how do we sort of, um, when we are talking about these performance measures, how can we bring more people to the table rather than less people to the table and how we can bring more money to the table and rather than one individual utility sort of investing into everything. And, uh, and that means that the regulatory processes and the permitting processes needs to change to enable that. Just to give you an example, if you want to build a um, uh, deal with sea level rise. These are the, the dots you see on this page are the different um, agencies and regulatory bodies and groups that you have to deal with uh, in order to build something. And just imagine one person on one com um, community wanting to go through this whole sleigh of groups that they deal with um, uh, getting permits for one project. It's costly, it's time consuming, it's hard. And every one of these dots coming with their own set of criteria and standards and measures, which they don't necessarily match the other person's measures. So when you're thinking about these multi-benefits, multi-sector, um, nature-based solutions, we actually need to think about this cross-sector benefits and cross-sector criteria and standards that needs to be reevaluated. Re 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 we did a study in the Bay Area, actually, we, we were uh, very interested in this sort of like efficiency of our permitting per process. And we, um, this was done um, as part of a, a research project on, by, by PhD, uh, sorry, a postdoc we had, uh, who is now a faculty down at UC Irvine. And um, she did a lot of interviews and also um, uh, looked at various permits and did a lot of web scraping and um, and permit scraping actually for boards and um, and complaints that have been um, uh, filed. And just to give you one example, what you see here is one of one uh, uh, developer has mentioned uh, this. They spent about four years, one million dollars, um, uh, and uh, at, by various uh, and. Uh, they had to, at the end, deal work with a congressperson uh, to obtain a, a permit for a, a green infrastructure. And, uh, you know, the construction work was only $2 million and eight months. So um, just, just think about the amount of resources that was spent there. And again, um, remember, we sort of the technological piece of this is ahead of the governance and management piece of this. So we are actually 
as we have more technologies coming in, as we are realizing nature, uh, like all these technologies can be beneficial to us or some of these solutions, actually maybe the word solution is much better than technology, solutions can be beneficial to us, we have to sort of go back and see how we can build this adaptive system in our governance structure to deal with these changes. Um, so as we are transitioning to this 21st century um, uh, water and climate, uh, to deal with water and climate challenges, we actually, again, uh, sort of wrapping up these pieces, we have to revisit and the performance measures and standards that we use to permit and finance our infrastructure. We have to develop multi-sector uh, performance measures that can bring in a lot of people together. And we have to think about nexuses, water quality and quantity, water and energy, land use and water. And I can, I'm 100% sure you can come up with 10 different other nexuses that is not here. And they all need to be considered if we really wanna build a more resilient future for ourselves. Um, just highlighting one thing here, which I think it's worth mentioning. And this was done during the time I was in the regional board. Um, I, I'm not gonna take credit for any of this, just part, partly because a lot of it done by staff and it has been a multi-year, um, multi-agency effort. Um, but, you know, the Measure AA was passed in 2016, and uh, the goal of it was um, to um, raise parcel taxes for $12 per year and raise $25 million to protect and restore the bay. And most of it was uh, to deal with water quality issues uh, and a sea level rise and uh, anything, and, and, and to be honest with you, and, and some of the pollutions that we are dealing with in the, in, the, in the region and try to do habitat restorations. So it's sort of thinking about multi-benefit projects. Um, and what we realized was, and staff realized was the only way to make sure this money can be invested mostly on projects rather than the challenge of permitting these projects, we have to create more collaboration and cooperative governance to make sure the permitting process moves forward faster. So um, there was a, um, um, a office set up, uh, San Francisco's Bay uh, Restoration Regulatory Integration Team, and um, basically is a collection of uh, permit, um, uh, permitting staff that we have uh, by, uh, from US Army Corps, Wildlife Services, NOAA, uh, San, uh, San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board, uh, which I was a member of till very recently, and uh, um, uh, California Fish and Life, Wildlife and BCDC. And basically the idea was if you bring these people together and make them think about these projects together, they can actually streamline these projects and think about how they can meet each other's, um, um, you know, the goals and standards that are set by each agency, but try to figure out how they can be coordinated across rather than sort of this linear system we had before, which people had to go through every agency and then deal and then go back again as they change the projects as they met, they had to meet the requirements by the other agencies. It's a great example. I've actually, um, in some of the work, uh, efforts I've done in um, DC, we have I have tried to bring this up as an example of how a local action has been very helpful um, to bring this forward. So um, with that, I'm, I'm gonna quickly move through this. This is sort of, we talked about green infrastructure, we talked about sort of uh, permitting um, um, issues. Uh, the, another issue is we want to make sure we are investing in solutions of today rather than tomorrow. And again, going back that, to that 21st century hybrid infrastructure, we want to make sure our uh, as demand is changing, as our need is sort of evolving, instead of focusing on these large, massive, costly infrastructure systems, um, we have to kind of revisit them and sort of think about some of the smaller, more marginal solutions that potentially can meet our not really changing demands, um, but actually can provide more flexibility in the system. And um, part of it can be done by being more smart and trying to use these smart technologies to be able to uh, prevent leakage and make sure our systems are run efficiently, prevent um, uh, you know, main breaks, um, trying to use these new technologies that are out there. And again, I'm not going to say this is panacea because it's not, but it can be a very helpful set of tools that can help us to manage the system much more efficiently, potentially, and actually engage with our customer more actively. 
Um, another piece of that is sort of the efforts around atmospheric rivers and for uh, forecasting foreign reservoir operations. I know many Bay Area region uh, water utilities are sort of considering this. They're uh, trying to incorporate that as part of their um, uh, climate informed um, um, uh, re the infrastructure management, um, and partly because we want to make sure we release water out of our dams in the right time and make sure we have enough space to store water as, as it comes down, especially since we are getting less uh, snow, more uh, precipitation comes down as rain, and we get these intense events that bring a lot of the water to us at one event rather than the more of a gradual process we used to experience before. Another piece of it is crazy, creating sort of the, taking advantage of the diversity, uh, sort of diversifying our water supplies and taking advantage of diversity of uh, opportunities that we have in our region. Um, uh, some of you have seen me talking about this before, but again, going back to this innovative policy and governance tools to enable regional water diversification, um, cap and trade uh, has been used many times in for so many different uh, projects. And, um, and I think one, uh, one example of that, uh, that many of us are familiar with is to, to deal with carbon emissions, but we have seen this happening in water quality, energy and ecosystem and a very common example that people forget about is the, the way we dealt with acid rain um, in the 1990s, which was sort of the, the same trading scheme was put in place to deal with the, um, uh, to kind of create collective action around dealing with a natural national um, uh, emergency. Um, and a um, very similar thing can happen. For our example, in the Bay Area, we depend on a common pool of water um, that, um, that's called Hetch Hetchy. Um, and uh, we, uh, we all sort of take and put water in that system as we, whatever we do in our system. So collectively we can work together as a region to reach certain diversification standards. Um, again, I don't think necessarily this can happen um, by a will of, uh, I, while I truly believe in a good will of our communities and water utilities, I think this needs to happen as a sort of standard setting that can happen at the state level, uh, similar to what we have done with the energy, uh, renewable energy portfolio, and um, try to actually, again, benefit from uh, what every community has and can bring to the table and how we can sort of minimize the cost to our region as we are diversifying, but actually maximize the benefits. Um, and some of that is happening, um, um, can happen in the Bay Area in a more active way, uh, basically investing in, in, um, in systems across the board and trying to subsidize the cost of diversification. Um, and also reducing risk, which is basically what you see here. So diversification, uh, trying to re reduce risk, increase resiliency, and uh, increase access to capital. And the last piece of this is something that I know most of you are familiar with, is the issue with workforce. And again, expanding green carriers and dealing with the aging uh, workforce that we are dealing with, um, uh, comparing water to many other um, um, uh, occupations that are out there, what we see is uh, water, um, the people who work in the water sector are much older, much less uh, racially diverse, and uh, they have, they don't have as much as many skill sets as one would have hoped. And uh, you can see that, especially when you look at the higher education piece, you don't, you see a lot of people who are not necessarily having a lot of higher education working in our sector. And again, it's not as common in the management level. Of course, there's so many high highly educated people working with so, so many utilities, but we have to look at the sector as a whole and as a whole sector can benefit from that. And um, just to leave you with a few thoughts here, um, we have to represent diversity of backgrounds, cultures, col color, age, and gender. That's, that's definitely key. And I know many utilities are trying to sort of create initiatives around that. I know San Francisco Public Utilities Commission has an initiative around this. And um, we have to, as we are transitioning to this smart water transition that we are experiencing and trying to use more gadgets and technologies in our system, we require a different set of expertise uh, in our workforce. We have to think about diverse educational background. 
we need more than just engineers. We need data scientists, climate scientists, science communicators, social scientists. We need people who can bring this diverse set of thinking to the table if you want to achieve a more uh, just and more forward looking industry that's actually not constantly falling behind, but actually uh, sort of charting the way forward. And um, with those five pieces, uh, I think we can potentially um, take, this take this opportunity, this challenge you're facing, COVID-19 challenge, and try to sort of um, chart the path forward as we are sort of revisiting our issues around uh, climate change, uh, business model that we already have, the aging um, uh, um, uh, workforce we are facing, the, uh, the governance silos we are have, and potentially we can benefit uh, with the, uh, um, the sort of the motivation the new administration has around dealing with climate and racial diversity and access um, to resources as a way of sort of leveraging some of those actions and adding to it from our, our end to make sure we are sort of moving forward rather than backward. And again, I just wanna um, close this by um, highlighting my um, co-author, Joe Kane um, um, from the Brookings Institute um, that helped uh, sort of draft this piece. I'm happy to send it to you if you are interested. And with that, I am done. Dennis, happy to answer any questions. Great. Uh, thank you, Nusha, for uh, really uh, covering a lot of a lot of ground and uh, a lot of water, <laughs> actually surface area of um, water. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so we'll open up uh, to questions we've been soliciting um, uh, questions and actually uh, uh, Carol Steinfeld's been active on, uh, on, on a, a number of fronts there. Um, yeah, you can keep that up for now, that's yeah, a good sure. um, And uh, uh, so um, she does, was asking about uh, um, the water demand mm -hmm. history. And uh, we actually did have a, a wet talk uh, on that. Uh, wet talk two famously was, um, on the high price of water demand overestimates. And, uh, but anyway, she says, given um, that lower than forecast casted uh, usage rates, um, which uh, I know Sarah Derringer chronicled uh, in like 20 districts across California um, over 20 years and, uh, um, and she says, anyway, so given those forecast uh, history and the great potential to further reduce water usage, oh, uh, she's asking about the, uh, the current litigation, uh, which I know Valley Water dropped out of uh, against the, uh, uh, I guess this was about the Delta water pen, but SFPUC and Bosca are, are still litigants. Um, uh, involved in the Bay Delta plan. Um, so any, any general comments on the Bay Delta plan and its litigation? Um, look, I, you know, I just joined SFPC, but I just attended my first meeting last week. And I think it's, it is an important issue. And actually I am, uh, we are going to have a, a conversation on demand uh, in the next few weeks. And uh, I am very much looking forward to that because, um, because I think demand is an important um, element. Um, we have to very much focus on it and um, make sure we are actually not overestimating and being thoughtful in the way we are measuring it. Um, one thing I would say is um, the urban demand is definitely um, is on, um, on, is decreasing and that is what we are experiencing. And, and I know a lot of people talk about demand hardening and hitting the bottom and all that. And I honestly, I I'm not sure when we are going to hit the bottom. We have studied, uh, we have looked at many Bay Area and actually California water agencies and we are way above where the bottom is. And uh, so there's still so much more efficiency in the system to be achieved. Now. Um, when it comes to agriculture, it's a different question, and you need to actually re, 
uh, visit the way we use water in agriculture. And I'll actually, I made a comment about land use and water use, which I think it's something that we as Californians need to focus on a lot more, especially as um, uh, we see changes in uh, crops and how we are sort of a lot of water, uh, a lot of agricultural communities are switching to these permanent crops that has um, high demand and permanent demand um, that's going to impact our system significantly. Um, so I'm sort of walking around the topic. I'm not at addressing it partly because again, I'm trying to kind of fully comprehend and understand what's going on uh, beyond just being an avid reader of the issues, but actually being in the weeds now. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, and everything is on the table. We are definitely wanting, want to make sure we're seriously considering all, uh, all of the issues around, all the environmental issues, demand, uh, change in demand, and, um, and um, some of the modeling that's happening in the region to, be, uh, to make sure that we are doing a correct job of understanding how our ecosystem is changing, understanding how our, the whole entire um, um, uh, watershed is responding to different climate change impacts. Um, so um, we are definitely seriously considering that. And um, I'm working with various um, um, staff members within the SFUC and also people outside to better understand how the modeling is working and what's, what's being done. Uh, one thought uh, uh, just that came from uh, your speaking was even the modeling of the work from home uh, yes. aspect and, uh, and its impact on water usage as opposed to Absolutely. you know uh, commercial real estate and then going forward um, assuming that there is more you know that that work from home is aspect is pretty sticky yes. you know and it's it's it, the projections might be let's conservative projection like a third of the time maybe. You know, I mean, in terms of how we go back um, and uh, what, what in, I, I don't know, I have no idea on that answer. I'm just kind of throwing that out. No, but no, and you you're absolutely correct. We are actually doing some of that work right now for uh, a few water agencies in Southern California. And you, you can definitely see there's a shift. Um, and, uh, and I know in San Francisco, uh, there have been a significant impact, especially being a, a financial and technology mm -hmm. hub and um, you know, uh, and the change in commercial water use is definitely real, and we don't know how long it's going to last and how it's going to change. And and one of the reasons, and I think Dennis, maybe maybe there's a piece here that I should highlight again is one of the reasons I was talking about demand and ch thinking about what we are, what kind of infrastructure we're building to meet demand is actually also this kind of stressors we are facing. Because it's not just about demand is changing, we have to not build large infrastructure. It's also when you are building those large infrastructure in the, in the sort of uh, anticipation for this increased demand, you have to maintain and operate those systems, right? So it's cost added to the system that you might not even need. So building flexibility in the system and trying to be more adaptive is key, especially while you're based on what we're dealing with. And um, uh, who would have anticipated uh, we'll be all working from home for a year? Uh, it was almost last March we all sort of were all sent home and God knows when we're gonna go back and how many of us are gonna go back. So, um, so we have to be more flexible and be able to deal with these stressors from climate stressors to these um, you know, uh, other kind of stressors such as the public health stressors such as COVID-19 and also demand stressors like and people's behavior change. Uh, I just wanted to continue with Carol and we have some other questions to go through. Um, uh, and unfortunately, I don't think we're gonna get to mine. <laughs> but anyway, um, again, with this is another SFPUC question specifically um, uh, about a, a kind of a past practice, uh, taking the position um, that it does not work with the wholesale buyers to share information and water demand management programs because it is not legally obligated. Um, is there potential for change in this area? Uh, kind of a specific SFPUC question there. Uh, I, 
back yeah, to I mean, you. You can take it as, you know. Yeah, and, and I'm, I would love to, I mean, I would love to have a list of all these questions and I would love to think through them. And I think, I think I would say, one thing I would say here is, as we move, and, and I didn't go much into that whole cap and trade model I presented. And, um, um, but as we move forward, the, whole, the goal of the 21st century is to create more transparency and democracy in the process. Otherwise, we are not going to make a lot of good decisions. And, um, and I think maybe that's, that's, the, that's, the, um, that's the answer to what you're saying. I think that you're, uh, you're, uh, th we have to revisit the way we do water. The, we have to re revisit our mm -hmm. business model, the way we manage our uh, infrastructure planning, rate setting, engagement, who is at the table, who is not at the table, uh, how do we do contracts, all these things have to be revisited. And um, we, can, we can either revisit it as time goes by and we, as we see changes coming, or at some point we have to revisit it when we are facing a natural disaster or a, a crisis or a um, or a serious um, um, uh, disruptor in the system. And, um, you know, and often those are hard choices that we have to make at that point and sometimes not very uh, efficient choices or effective choices. But um, so being proactive is much more important. Well, we only have to look at today's headlines uh, to see about planning in a utility sense. I mean, it's electricity, yep. but it's also potable water, Absolutely. right? I mean, Absolutely. you know, Houston is under boil water yep. uh, uh, advisory, but people don't have any energy to do it. So, I mean, they're, they're melting snow at this point. And uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so that kind of questioning and, and uh, flexibility and, and planning is, is obviously a key thing. And we have great examples, unfortunately, of not doing that. Um, I, uh, you mentioned um, uh, water cap and trade, and I, so that gave me an opportunity to uh, have a question from uh, Mai Ling Shek. Uh, she does ask, is there an, any organization in the Bay Area promoting green infrastructure and water cap and trade? I was kidding with Mai that uh, I know Sustainable Silicon Valley is very big in terms of nature-based solutions and green infrastructure and is very cheered with HR 1132 introduced by Jackie Spear with co-authors of every congressional person representing the Bay Area. And uh, it's actually through Congress and into that big pile of bills in the Senate, um, or I guess it's a smaller pile because the, the ones from last year uh, might need rework. But anyway, that's in the Senate and uh, I think, uh, you know, we should be seeing that. And that basically matches Measure AA, creates uh, uh, an office in uh, EPA uh, Region 9, and right. uh, hopefully um, will prioritize nature-based solutions in uh, the work that they do. So that's, that's another significant bucket of money coming for uh, the historically underfinanced Bay Restoration uh, aspects. Um, we've come a long way yeah. from wanting to pave it over. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I would say green infrastructure has come a long way in the past 10, 15 years. Um, there's a lot more recognition that we have to work with nature rather than sort of um, uh, conquer it. Uh, there is, um, there's a lot of interest in that. I think there are a lot of different groups that are working in green infrastructure. And I would say, um, um, I, I know the uh, regional water board, the Bay Area Regional Water Board has played a key role in making sure uh, nature-based solutions are part of the, some of the regulatory processes and uh, that we have and some of the permits and that we have been uh, sort of um, revising and reestablishing. And so, um, it, you know, uh, especially when we're dealing with stormwater and issues around stormwater management. Um, so um, I know BCDC is also trying to do that. So there is a lot of recognition and, and interest in this topic. And um, cap and trade, uh, unfortunately, not as much. Uh, there are some conversation on uh, dealing with nitrate in the Bay and using cap and trade as a way of doing that. 
not established yet. Um, but on water supply diversification, um, uh, you know, we have done it, this exercise uh, in my team for uh, both Bosca and Sonoma County Water Agency sort of demonstrating how as a pilot this can help reduce cost of diversification and increase resiliency uh, in the region. Um, but as a um, sort of a practice, sort of, um, in, it hasn't been implemented. Uh, it's more of an academic exercise, but we actually worked very closely both with Bosca and, um, and um, um, Sonoma County Water Agency when we were doing those uh, research projects and they were definitely very um, essential in providing data, helping us making sure that we set the, um, everything correctly and understand the system well and know every nitty gritty that's in the system. Um, actually, and uh, kind of jumping onto that, uh, recently a, you know, a water trading market has been established as a kind of a commodity market. And uh, so I just wanted to throw that out uh, for comment. Which is very different from what yeah. we were talking yeah. about, obviously. That's more like trying to sell, um, using markets as a way of managing risk, which, you know, it's a very small market that um, future trading that we're talking about, that's more like a stock market sort of trading and um, or commodities, yeah. commodity trading. Yes. Yeah. Um, so um, it's a, it's a very small market and I'm, you know, and I'm not necessarily sure. I'm not sure it's a, how it's going to evolve. I would just add two thoughts there. One is um, when you are creating these commodity markets, if you don't have everybody at the table, we need to question whose risk are we trying to reduce? Are we reducing the risk of some of the decisions that are being made by big actors to make sure they, do, they can do what they want and then reduce their risk of uh, consequences of their actions by being part of this process? Or is this really reducing the risk of um, uh, environmental um, uh, sort of consequences or social consequences uh, for, um, you know, uh, for groups that are not at the table, for example, um, uh, small farmers or, uh, or rivers and environmental um, players that might actually uh, be impacted by this. And I'm not necessarily sure that's going to lead into sustainability, because if you can actually reduce your risk by buying um, uh, by buying um, or being part of this commodity trading process, um, I'm not sure you will make a lot of sustainable choices because at the end you can reduce your risk by um, buying, um, uh, you know, uh, by buying into the systems. Uh, yeah, that's uh, definitely something to, to look but, at. Uh, yeah, definitely. And, and I would say, again, it's a speculation. This is just, just started. Obviously, we have to mm -hmm. see how it works. And, and there's always a way to revisit, readjust, and improve systems. So, um, yeah. I mean, it, it seems like it's almost a, a water version of carbon credits, which are very uh, problematic. Uh, yeah, uh, and I, I would say, side. yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, switching gears a little bit, um, uh, Eric Rosenblum is up uh, and uh, he commented on the 19th century law, 20th century infrastructure, 21st century problems, um, uh, the, that which is, uh, yes, quite a great coinage. And, uh, um, but his question is uh, uh, the, about the progress um, of, with Brit agencies making towards integrating regulations to promote green infrastructure? Um, and are there similar initiatives to bring the utilities together in the same manner? Um, I wanted to mention, by the way, a bit of a plug, uh, uh, water roundtables, uh, talking about getting people around the table. Uh, that is a current project with, and that SSV is doing on a number of these topics. Um, like you mentioned, uh, the silver tsunami, uh, nature-based solutions, and actually uh, even uh, private water company rate structures and PUC. Those are like three roundtables that we're looking to form in terms of working groups. But anyway, back to uh, that question uh, about BRIT agencies and 
um, utilities, local utilities? Yeah, so I, I think Brit is a very um, innovative way of approaching this. This is not the first time we are doing this. Uh, there was an effort around um, um, uh, um, sediment management in the Bay and, um, and uh, which um, uh, the similar um, effort was put together and, um, and I can't remember the name of it, so I apologize, but I would be happy to send that to you, um, just blogging out. Um, but you know, there is a hope that Brit can help, and I think it can be expanded and it can be useful in the way we are dealing with infrastructure and green infrastructure and um, um, and um, in and issues around that. And so, um, you know, we we can potentially expand it. It's an exercise. It's a pilot, um, and we would like to see how it would um, it would help us as we move through this process. And uh, I do, uh, speaking of plugs, uh, Valley Water um, had a, a really good nature-based solutions uh, conference uh, in January that did include uh, uh, a number, well, included EPA and a number of like the Brit agencies as well. And uh, it was great. I have to say, I, I was so uh, pleasantly surprised to see these hardcore engineers embracing nature-based solutions, you know, and I kept telling them I was having flashbacks because I've been involved with like living future and biomimicry and everything. And people, you know, were just thinking it was quackery and to have, um, you know, for it, so for having a similar thing in terms of that nature-based approach, which is well-proven and actually Oro Loma, over in San Leandro has been yeah. doing all the great work. David Sedlak's been doing his- And I would studies. say just, just plugging in for a regional board, you know, often regulatory agencies are, uh, you know, brushed by being inflexible and not doing innovative things. We, you know, we work closely with that project and to make sure they have a permit and they can pilot that program. And uh, while I'm absolutely appreciative of David Sidlak and a lot of scientists who promoted this idea, the reality is that um, that regulatory uh, vision um, that was put in place and the work that our staff did to make sure that can be happen that can happen uh, is definitely exemplary. And I would like to highlight that because they're they're the ones who are often forgotten in this process. Um, uh, here's a bit of a, a half of a plug. Um, a future wet talk. I'm not. I can't say today that it will be in March. Um, will involve basically what I'm calling the Tom and Dave show, and that is basically Mr. Mumley and Smith, the two key points of regulation in terms of uh, uh, Bay Area water quality. And um, I. So I'm. I'm kind of. Uh, negotiating with them to get them together and to talk about a number of uh, these issues from uh, the Bay Area Water Board as well as uh, EPA. Absolutely, and, uh, and I'm so glad that I'm sure Tom can, you know, he has been there for a long, long time and he can provide a, a wealth of knowledge and valuable insight in how the agency has evolved over time and how they have embraced so many different things um, uh, to promote, um, um, a greener path forward as we are dealing with challenges with the water quality in our region. And one other thing I want to say is I, I think one, I didn't answer this part of Eric's question on are there any similar initiatives to bring the utilities together. And I would say um, there's a, there are a lot of talks, but I'm not necessarily sure there are a lot of, um, I don't think there's something similar to Brit that is bringing water agencies together. But, you know, something like that can be definitely useful uh, I have seen water agencies work around one infrastructure together, trying to sort of see if this one infrastructure can help the region. Um, but uh, it's not, um, I don't think it's very, um, I don't think it's, um, uh, it's systematic. So and maybe we need a more systematic way of doing it. Yeah, so uh, actually Carol Steinfeld had a, a question about implementing a one water approach in San Mateo County. And to that uh, um, specifically, I was going to say that I think 
to the extent that it will be new implementation, it's going to be from the Bay end. Right. You know, it's going to <laughs> come from that. So I, I'm, I, I hope that uh, this kind of uh, coordination would, would, would impact that because with San Mateo County and its long coastline, um, you know, the sea level rise questions and the questions at the mm -hmm. Bay's edge have, have been, there's a lot of good kind of work there. And I have a feeling hopefully that that will move inland as far as more of a one water approach. Right. Um, the, uh, I, I did want to get to a question from uh, Christine Kolzalk um, and uh, about uh, uh, top drivers to moving towards a circular economy, a model um, mentioning, you know, wastewater as a resource. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously we've seen it as a resource, even with COVID testing. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, and so just as one example and that, boy, uh, I tell you in December, 2019, um, I became aware of RNA sequencing of, testing, you know, and the, just the potential of that. And uh, it seemed like, you know, something from science fiction. And uh, here we are. Yeah. I mean, I would say um, that's a very good question. Um, and the whole water vesicle economy sort of model is, it's what fascinates me and it scares me at the same time. And I tell you why. Fascinates me because obviously I'm so excited to see that we are sort of trying to move towards dealing with wastewater as a, as a source of water. And this whole movement toward one water is, is very encouraging. And so many water agencies are embracing it, trying to actually build it into their uh, planning process, trying to think about it that way, uh, trying to actually tr sort of uh, go across um, uh, silos and work with um, different um, agencies and try to kind of um, uh, build better circular water economies. Um, so it is, so I would say um, the drivers are different, but at least in our region or Southern California is obviously scarcity is an issue. So the more we can do, we can deal with circular economy. Um, you know, we can have uh, potential, the more water available to us during time of droughts and uh, water, um, scarcity uh, times. Um, the second thing is, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the re uh, recognition that potentially some of that energy uh, can be recovered and reduce the cost of energy for utilities. Obviously all these utilities are looking at the water, at their bills and, and energy is a big part of water utilities bill um, uh, comes from the purification to um, to um, uh, distribution, to all the different pieces that goes into the uh, process of taking the water out of a source and bringing it to us. So this recognition that there's a cost associated with that is just sort of making it more exciting. If you have an opportunity to work with it, if you have a connection with your wastewater utility, trying to close that circle is important. Another piece of that has been in California, at least, um, is the issue around seawater intrusion. So for example, you hear a lot in Orange County that um, you know, they were one of the first utilities that embraced water reuse, but actually that whole action um, uh, was uh, uh, sort of built around on the topic of seawater intrusion and the fact mm -hmm. that their uh, groundwater basins was being mined and they were having issues with seawater intrusion. So they wanted to prevent that. So they started doing reuse in order to recharge the groundwater to prevent seawater intrusion. And eventually they realized, oh, this is a source then we can use. So these are these, you know, so the drivers have not been, uh, it's not as common everywhere, but definitely water scarcity and access have been part of drivers of uh, promoting reuse. Um, and, and I would say um, uh, one thing that scared me, and I, I know, uh, you know, I say this often, and people, uh, some people don't necessarily like uh, hearing it, is that we are, we are sort of uh, doing this reuse thing in a very fast way without necessarily providing a systematic thinking of what is it that we are building and how it is going to impact us as a system. So um, 
the reality that we have a centralized reuse system being built in the Bay Area, or we have one already, and then you have all these um, camp, uh, tech campuses doing their own on-site reuse, which means that they're not going to plug in into this centralized system. Um, potentially, they want to have their own system. And the so is sort of like a... Um, uh, interconnection and the sort of the butting against each other, this whole on-site systems and or small reuse systems versus centralized reuse systems is an, a serious issue that needs to be considered. And it scares me because I don't want to look back in 20 years and say, we invested in things that ended up being a stranded asset because we didn't have a right vision in place or we didn't do the right set of, um, we didn't provide the right set of perspective on what is it that we need where do we need it and how should we do it? And that is what scares me. Yeah, that say the architecture of uh, water reuse is, is a, something, yes, I know that uh, um, uh, we're very interested in. Uh, I mean, this idea of satellite systems and uh, that kind of integration. Um, right. And uh, there is, I mean, interconnections are reality, even if you're a tech campus, you are connected to the local system. And I think there's potential for benefit um, of this, but obviously right. when we talk about water, we talk about silos and that is not <laughs> the greatest uh, basis uh, 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 for uh, cooperation, but, right. but um, I, I'd love to see in a way the, 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 the water, oh, I talk about the water grid um, and, and I do have a background in kind of energy and, uh, uh, you know, and, and so it, I see, you know, some potential for that um, basically with uh, uh, really good um, sensors. And I mean, you know, just there, there can be this potential where in the electrical grid, uh, there isn't too much worry about who owns what electron, you know, I mean, the, I mean, besides the Texas grid, which is cut off from the rest of the country. I mean, that aside, um, you know, there's, there is potential. There is, for there is, the challenge with water is obviously uh, that, uh, you know, we have done tons of work sort of comparing water and energy sector, and there's tons to be learned from the energy sector, probably because they have been ahead of us. And actually they are right now facing what I'm just talking about with the whole, mm -hmm. um, uh, overinvestment and underrealization of the system interconnection and the systematic perspective of what needs to be done. Um, um, but the, the challenge is, you know, water, obviously not every drop of water is the same and it's not as easily can be moved everywhere. So it's, uh, that definitely provides some limitations, but within a region, you can think about it that way very well because, um, there's, there, there's enough, inter, we have enough interconnection in this, in this region that we can actually take one water from one place and replace it with another drop somewhere else. Yeah. So that sort of cap and trade model or sort of uh, exchange is very much of a real a possibility in our region and some of the other regions that depend on a common source of uh, water. Oh yeah, no, I, well, it's certainly, Areas that that uh, would be um, well, new thinking would certainly be rewarded. Right. Um, I mean, you know, certainly worthwhile to spend the time in terms of thinking. And you mentioned actually Orange County Water District, um, and in terms of seawater uh, right. incursion, you know, and, and having a uh, that as a bulwark against uh, the sea. Obviously, Monterey, Pure Water Monterey, sure. yep. and uh, Soquel Creek are doing those things, albeit, you know, maybe a smaller uh, uh, systems, but, but uh, certainly they have those real problems. I mean, there's a, there's a reason it's called the Salinas Valley. Um, you know, it's the salt. Uh, and uh, so, um, you know, those are, those are uh, really uh, good um, kind of examples of, of that application. And then of course, with the Carmel River draw, you know, in uh, well, more than in question, um, you know, it's become now uh, on, uh, in Monterey, for instance, uh, uh, the main source of water. And uh, that needs to be played out as they look to do part two. And uh, they've demonstrated success, for instance, Pure Water Monterey, and they, they're dealing with <laughs> the impacts of their success. 
Um, I did want to just um, mention, a, a, it's not quite a question, but it's a, a mention that Joe Frisbee had put out about Miguel Altieri at Berkeley, um, an agro, well, someone involved in the nature of agro ecosystems. Um, he's been talking about, well, the broken model, which I think was your uh, 20, 19th century law, 20th century infrastructure um, for 20 years to deaf ears. So hopefully there's more um, live ears listening, uh, um, but he's talking about the system right now of assumption of cheap, abundant energy, cheap, abundant water, technology, harnessing the nature. And yeah. um, I would say, you know, there's phytoremediation now, there, that's, that's really coming to the fore and nature-based solutions. So ho hopefully that, you know, we've, um, we've hit peak cheap abundancy. Yeah, and I think I wanna address Joe's comment. I, I think he's right. And I, I personally have been talking about this for 20 years and I think it's just <laughs> sort of gradually picking up. Um, but, but a couple of things that he mentioned, actually I had a slide that I didn't include here, which, which touch, touches on this whole thing that you know, this whole concept of abundance is, is really killing us. There's no abundance. It just, we have to sort of reimagine how we do things within the limitations that we have and we are not doing it. And I think, I love the, the American enthusiasm for technologies and how they're going to save us forever from everything, but the reality is they're not going to. And we have to be very much, much more mindful of how we, use every resource that we have, be it water or energy or anything or nature, uh, you know, and um, because we need them to survive and we have to be more mindful. And unfortunately, when I look at the actions around energy sector, sort of like uh, climate change and uh, climate change mitigation, every single one of those are I mean, not every single, but many of, majority of them are focused on what's the next energy uh, mm -hmm. solution that gonna have the least amount of emissions, but I can drive my car as fast as I can because it's electric and I can go everywhere. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like just a simple example of how we are sort of approaching this, which I think it's, it's not helpful. No, it's uh, basically extended manifest destiny. Absolutely. And, and a lot uh, of, and one, one last thing I would say here is um, we are dealing today with the consequences of the decisions we made during the 20th century. We didn't know some of those consequences. We just did build things and thought they are going to be okay because we didn't know the system very well. But maybe actually, if, if you go and look back, you can see there were some at that time, there were people who were mentioning that some of these decisions we are making around infrastructure could have certain consequences, but they fell on deaf, deaf ears. And I think right now we have an option of thinking about the next 50 to 100 years, not just two years from now. And unfortunately our utilities are very much set up to make sure in the next 10 years, I, if I'm in charge, I don't do anything that's gonna impact me and how I'm doing things rather than thinking, okay, what I'm doing now, how it's going to impact everybody in the next 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And we have to absolutely change the way we do things. We have to think about these consequences way ahead of time before, before doing things. Well, as, and as you say, uh, you have a quote here that we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them, uh, yes. which is very apt. Um, Nusha Ajami, I wanted to thank you very much for this time. We could probably go another so many hours, but we did come up to our allotted time of 11.30. And uh, um, thanks for blowing many parts of our mind. And uh, I actually, you have a living map uh, um, uh, thing yes. up as well. I wanted to draw on because that is one of the initiatives that we're working on in-house. Um, we are hoping to have a major ArcGIS expansion at SSB, and uh, um, we're, we're actually working on that actively. Um, okay. And uh, uh, yeah, because we want to do a lot of mini story maps. 
That sounds great. Thank you so much, Dennis. Thank you, everybody. And happy to answer any questions if you want to reach out to me. I, yeah, we will. I'll, I'll circulate the chat uh, text. You know, it'll be a text file and uh, um, we'll uh, go on from here. So thank sounds you good. very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.